you know, she's, mm -hmm. she, she first started me too. Went to her classes and I was like, oh wow, smart people are doing this. Well, I you. and I'll welcome to the Groomers Cut. We have are Melissa Pontiner, Michelle Knowles, myself, and Jennifer Bishop Jenkins from the Groomers Cut. We are, Cut. we're live, um, hello. I'm not even sure what our lovely topic is uh, tonight. I'm sure we talked behavior. about it. We're still in, in animal behavior, behavior, dog behavior during grooming. And maybe we could even touch on cats because people asked about that. But friends, oh Dara, Dara is having major internet problems. Poor yes. Dara. But at least she got us live finally. That's great. Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you, Dara, from a distance. <laughs> I know. Poor Dara. She has just left off. So, so last week we talked to Katie, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that? Uh, we talked to her about uh, behavior within the daycare setting. And Dara actually says that we were to talk about the four stages of developmental, the developmental stages of puppies and things like that. Oh, okay, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Who would like to start us off? Well, I can, I can tell you about a class that I took um, for um, uh, the developmentally appropriate a ways to bring a puppy into a grooming program. And I built a program called the VIP, the Very Important Puppy, uh, off of it that I offer to my to my clients. And um, I really try to get the word out, uh, you know, as much as possible that we start them as early as eight to nine weeks uh, at all the way to 16 weeks. I want to do them before they get too much older with this pr a program that's just little piecemeal steps. So we do four visits for $100, which is a bargain. And um, the first visit is with the mom sometime after their f uh, first shot. Anytime after their first shot, they can come. They still have mom's immunities. A lot of people think that you have to wait until the rabies shot to come for grooming, and you don't. No, because I don't think they get rabies until later. Four months, till four months at least. Yeah. And, and, and they all have antibodies from their mother um, that protect them. And not only that, but they can't get the rabies. I mean, they can't, you know, they can't get the rabies at that point. So, um, anyway, so this developmental program that I actually, um, took a day long course about, um, introduces step by baby step, just the same way as you would a human child. It introduces them first to sounds and smells. And remember that a dog's primary sense is smell. You and I are, visual primarily, but dogs are, they learn the world from their noses. And so the first visit, and we require this to be done very early, like almost before we open, um, but right, you know, early in the day when it's very quiet uh, or quieter. And we have the mom stay for the first visit and the first visit is 15 minutes. And the puppy comes in and we go through the lobby, we let them smell. Then we let them go off leash in the grooming room, which is closed off. And we just let them smell the room. And then we walk them back into the bathing room and we let them smell that room and then the drying room and let them smell that room and just let them wander at their own pace. Uh, we pick them up and put them on the table, give them a treat, say their name, pet them, do a little bit of your um, now I'm going to do a little more than petting after having Melissa's <laughs> class at, at the All-American about um, just that really neat way that you can pet uh, them and um, and just touch their toes, like not actually do toenails, but just to touch the toes and turn a clipper on near them and then praise them again and then set them back down on the floor and let them go home with mommy. 15 minutes. That's the first the first introduction. And then we try to go on two week um, intervals, but you know, if they don't start the program till 12 weeks then they go on one week intervals, but we do four visits um, and that's the first. And the second visit, we do um, a sort of a foot back of the body bath. We don't go anywhere near the head uh, and we never use high velocity dryers. We take them right back to the table. We don't use chamois even on them. We towel wrap them in a little baby burrito, very soft. Um, then we take them to the table. And again, lots of eye contact, lots of saying their name, 
Um, lots of putting, uh, the, uh, we use a, a gentle dryer, a, the, one of the does dryers, um, which are those white boxes that stand on your table with a soft arm. And they're very adjustable in terms of, they're quiet. They're very adjustable in terms of, of noise. And then we very gently, you know, blow dry the back. We try a little ho holding again of the nails. Usually the nails don't need to be clipped, but we'll kind of go through the motions of clipping their nails um, and, you know, give them treats. And again, try to get them in and out within half hour, 40 minutes or so. And um, then the third visit um, we tr and the fourth visit, we try to do full baths. Um, very gently on the face at the third bath and, you know, do all of the things again, pretty much the same. Um, no forcing of anything. The, the important thing is that they experience the sensations, the sounds of clippers, the sounds of the blow dryers, the feel of the water, the smells of the space. And the reason why the first visit has to be mom stays and then ma and they smell and then they go is that they need to get that quick early reinforcement that when i come here mom is taking me home so so we do everything that we can to reinforce the experience there's really not much grooming to it maybe by the fourth visit we might do you know a little we'll do maybe by the third visit a little eye trim if they'll allow it it's all what they you know it, it's nothing is forced um, so it's just whatever they're easy with. And um, we might try a little bit of a sanitary trim by the fourth visit, but it's, it's amazingly effective. If I could just say this to all groomers, all business owners, the puppies that I have that go through my VIP program versus the puppies I have that do not go through my VIP program is dramatic. It's a huge difference between the puppies that have had these four short visits um, and the puppies that don't, if, if the first time you, you all know, that's the first time you see a, a dog. If the first time you see them is at eight months of age, when they're a doodle going through coat change and they're solid mats and their first groom is traumatic as hell, that's going to make their rest of their life. You know, trauma, this is a, a subject that I, my husband and I are somewhat experts in because of our work with victims, crime victims. Both my husband and I have had murders in our family. That's how we met. We both work in, in the national victim community. That's a whole other teaching gig that I do. And one of the things that um, I've learned a great deal about, mainly from my husband, who's this college professor, knows a lot about neurobiology, is that trauma is a very real thing. And early trauma can permanently change the way you perceive things for the rest of your life. And so puppies and dogs experience trauma too. They have traumatic memories just like people can and triggers that can reawaken those traumatic memories. And so it's really, really, really important that these early experiences be all gentle, loving, positive, nothing forced. Do not attempt to clip the toenails unless you're just barely touching them and just maybe like a little tap with a drummel kind of a thing because you do not want to quick a nail. You do not want to use a high velocity dryer. You do not want to squeeze them, force them, um, uh, you know, hold them tight. You don't, you want everything to be positive. And if you do those early things when they're baby babies, because this is, you know, I do this between eight and 16 weeks. Usually I don't get them until about 12 weeks though. Because a lot of people don't, yeah. Which is between the eight and 16 week period is considered the fear time, the fear yeah. period when they're afraid of so much because I also uh, breed and have puppies. So that's a huge part of why I and mine are littles, uh, Shih Tzus, and they're uh, usually tinies. So a large uh, reason why I don't let them go until they are 12 to 16 weeks old is because I want them to get used to and come be out of that fearful stage and be in, into that, what they call like the prepubescent, you know, like that mm -hmm. adolescent stage where they're a little bit more happy go lucky and that everything scares them. And so. Mm -hmm. um, and in 90% of my puppy clients that do the VIP, we don't see them until they're 12 weeks because right. of the fact that the, the, the owners don't even pick them up usually in time. So usually it's a 12 
12 to 16 week, once a week right. thing. But mm -hmm. even if I don't get a puppy until it's over four months of age, whatever is that first visit is going to be done very carefully and very much with that eye towards no traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, that is absolutely the best case scenario, that whole VIP package. I love it. I love everything about it. Um, I do um, like to assess each puppy because they're all individuals and not everybody needs those four visits. Some people only need one. Some people need none. Some puppies come in and go like, I got this and you can just do everything. So I do take a moment. Uh, I do allow them to snuffle. I do allow them to just be touched and go home if that's what they require. But I want to see how far I can take them uh, and not necessarily to hysterics. I just want to see right. what they're capable of. I want to know what they're capable of. And I'm going to give them the freedom to tell me, okay, that's a little bit too much. So we know exactly where to start the next time. Uh, because not all puppies are the same. Sometimes you get a puppy, like you were saying, that's eight months old. Because nobody told the owner that they were supposed yep. to be socialized into grooming and trained into yep. grooming. That's bad. So even though they do have trauma, even though they, they are fearful or have never done it before, they absolutely can be um, rehabilitated. It's something that I do every day, all day. Uh, and all of us here, I think, have some type of fear recovery program that they work with behaviorally. Uh, so it just every dog, dog that comes across your, yeah, every dog that comes across your table deserves that because we get a lot of new clients who mm -hmm. aren't necessarily puppies who may have had horrifying things happen to them before and are fearful. And you can bring them back. You can show them that's only that place. Or that time that that happened, it won't happen here. So they will associate the smells of your salon or you or the way you share energy with them with something that's good and nice. Tell One me, thing tell I wanted us, to bring up us. as well yeah. is that when they have their fearful stage, people don't realize children, humans and puppies alike are very similar. And we do learn by trauma. Uh, and as harsh as that sounds, it, it's not all the way. I'm not saying, you know, smack them around or do anything like that. Right. But fearfulness is, is, a, is a survival skill. Uh -huh. And it's Absolutely. a very important skill to develop. Know when to be afraid and when not to. Uh -huh. And when you think about their entire world is their nose when they're a puppy, uh -huh. many dogs can't see very well. And right. uh, I have seen this in a lot of puppies. Don't forget that they do have sight. And movement is what their hunter brain is attracted to. Right. Movement is also very scary. The movement of someone, the movement of a dryer hose, the movement of a towel uh, yes. can sometimes be very frightening for them as well. Just not the scent, but the actual movement of things happening. Yeah, no, that's true. One of my bathers was working on another dog while I was doing a puppy once, and he kind of snapped the towel, you know, to sort of get it. And, and it was you know, five feet away and the puppy freaked out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really, uh, how do you, I was going to ask you, Michelle, to speak to how do you, and of course, Melissa, you could talk about your touch therapies too. Um, uh, how do you rehabilitate trauma with an older puppy? I think the first step to rehabilitating an older dog or an older puppy, uh, with trauma or fear uh, is simply being the rock that they can cling to. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Your emotional state, I yeah. don't care what you've got going on in the salon or if you're arguing with somebody or you're having a bad, bad day, all that literally gets put to the wayside and all that's left is me and that dog. And I'm going to be the rock to which he can cling. I'm going to do everything smoothly. I'm going to let him smell everything before I use it on him or before I introduce it into the grooming area. He gets to smell and investigate every single thing. And then I will gently, and there are times when I do have them go through the process, but it is slow. It is gentle. If I do have to restrain them, it is with as little restraint as possible. Mm -hmm. I very rarely use a muzzle. I haven't even used one this year or last year, as a matter of fact. So, I mean, I can count maybe on two hands the times that I've used muzzle in 35 years. Wow. Yeah. So, it, and I'm not saying that that's what you should need to do. That's what I do. That's mm -hmm. how I, I'm comfortable with doing it. And I have had great success in using that method. Um, I can teach it, but unless you're, unless you're able to develop your skill of separating all that's bothering you to the never, never land. Like it doesn't even matter. Like it's not even there. 
unless you can do that, I don't recommend the level <laughs> of fear recovery that I, I do, uh, unless you have that. And sometimes it's a gift. Sometimes it's a skill that's developed, or sometimes you can teach it to somebody and they, they have that light bulb moment. Uh, but it's not for everybody. It, it's not for everybody. And if you're finding yourself, um, being uh, upset or frustrated with one of your fear recoveries, um, put the dog up, take a deep breath, wash your face, and then detach yourself from your own emotions because all you have to have left is compassion for this little being that's trying their best. Absolutely. It's not there because they want to be. They yep. have no choice. They're completely at our mercy. So we have to give them all the love, compassion, and gentleness that we can possibly give them. Amen to that. Uh, and, and it varies from pet yeah. to pet, but I usually, I like a good power walk. Uh, if they're very frightened yes. and they can't obey any authority and they're just scattered, then they need to focus on me. Yep. That's when you power walk them. If they're just terribly fearful, you need to make sure that they know that you're going to protect them from every single thing around them and you become their rock. That means yep. don't let dogs close. You don't let people pet. You don't let people mm -hmm. talk to them. You are the wall between them and the world. And then they become very calm and they trust you. And from there will blossom a trust for the salon. And then I have even seen dogs blossom in their social behavior with other dogs because they learned how to be groomed correctly. Uh, right. It matters. We're so intimate with their bodies so that you have to respect them. Uh, I can't stress that enough. Asking permission, uh, running your hand down the flank and lifting the leg uh, at the hawk, in front of the hawk, uh, is how you ask permission to lift up that leg. The same, you you run your hand down their shoulder to their pasterns, and then you gently apply pressure, and then you wait until they acquiesce to that pressure before picking up that foot. If you get into the habit of doing that every single time with every single thing that you do to the dog, let them know what you're going to do next. It should not be a surprise. That way they can calm down. They know that that foot goes first, that foot goes second, and the whole routine is the very same every single time. Then that's when you can calm that down. Is, and that is good. Foot. And if everybody, if you have, a like me, multiple, multiple staff, it's really good if you can get everybody on the same page with what comes first, what comes second, and so on. Yeah, that's well, very that's good. If you, if you don't do that, Jennifer, if you don't get everybody on the same page, you will find that you get all of those types of dogs that you've worked with. They'll yes. get all those types of dogs that they've worked with. But if you have a sick employee or somebody that has to catch out for a medical appointment or yep. get their kids early or whatever, that dog goes to their table. Now what? Yeah. So it does behoove you as a salon. It doesn't matter what routine it is, but it should be very similar. So that all yeah. the dogs, no matter yep. what table they end up on, can absolutely have the same routine experience. Mm -hmm. Your brain functions on that level where they want, they look for routines. That's mm -hmm. how they're hardwired. And depending on the breed, even more so when you get those herding breeds and you get those hunting breeds, they look for cues that trigger their brain to react in a specific way. Mm -hmm. So I personally, I know uh, you have hurt, you work with herding breeds, Jennifer. I personally I have, love them. You know, tribbles, you know, little, yes. fuzzball, little, hair, little hairy fuzzballs. Right. right. But I, I start my puppies out as soon as they're born. I start with touching the feet, touching their faces, calling them, holding them close to me. So they smell me and they get used to me. Um, when the ears open and they can hear and their little eyes open up and they really can't see much but shadow. Right. I start again with walking them around the house, holding them so that they can just feel the movement, the jostling of being held. Play a C I have a CD that I bought at a, um, a Halloween store. <laughs> <laughs> that has screams and, and rattling ah! screams and all kinds of ambulance noises and all kinds of stuff. And I play that almost like on a loop. It drives my husband crazy, but it works because it desensitizes them a little bit. I do the same thing with feet. I take a Q-tip because little teensy weensy feet, you know? And so I take a Q-tip and I rub that on the pads and in between the pads rub it on the ear. It's a different sensation than my fingertips, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when they get to be about, and I always wipe them down, warm washcloths, that kind of stuff. But once they're about six weeks old, 
after they get that, um, I usually do first shots between six and eight weeks old, depending on how big the puppy is. That's when I actually start the full on grooming. But before that, I will hold them and hold my clipper close to them and let them feel that vibrate those vibrations, that kind of stuff. But once they're at eight, you know, six to eight weeks old, I start whether um, doing their uh, booties, you know, I, I, I do like face, feet and fanny on them. And mm. so I start cleaning them up and doing those kind of things. So they get used to that bathing comes and um, I start to bathe them in the big tub that I bathe the, you know, the big ones in and I put them in that and they're so little, but <laughs> it gives them a sense of, Oh, okay. I, I under, you know, when they get this done mm -hmm. on a regular basis, Oh, I know what this big area is, you know, mm -hmm. and the same thing from there with the dryer. I wrap them in the towel, snuggle them up nice and warm. I don't have a hoodie that's big enough or small enough for them most of the time. So what I usually do, we'll just take the cotton and put the cotton in the ears. And I have an adjustable high force dryer, you know, a variable speed. Mm -hmm. I have a little Chris Christensen one. I call it my cat dryer. It's my puppy dryer. But I expose them to those because that has a frequency and a vibration. Mm -hmm. So I expose them to that as well. So I work a lot with puppies that people get puppies that are, have fears and anxieties over grooming and they'll bring them to me from other groomers. I'll say, Oh, take them to Melissa because she can work with mm -hmm. them and get them used to being groomed. So having the right tools and making um, kind of makeshift things like putting cotton in the ears and doing those kind of things and working with them slowly. I also use a regular handheld blow dryer. Yep. We do that to too. Help, yeah. right, to help with uh, drying areas. So they get used to that understand the louder your clippers are the more frightening that is mm -hmm. so make sure that your blade drives are good and that your clippers are well oiled and that your equipment is in good working condition and, so and, and i heard a great suggestion i think it was sue watson that said take your clipper turned on and pet the dog with it yeah pet, pet the puppy mm -hmm. with it so that the vibration of the clipper is just as a as a, as a sort of a soothing thing at first and when yeah. I use that, that high force dryer, I have so many videos on my on my uh, House of Zen Facebook page. That's the puppy page for my mom and I. And I have so many videos of me high force drying them, holding them in my hand like this and mm -hmm. have the high force dryer way up here. And some of them scream. And I'm like, I just turn them and look at them. I move it away. And I'm like, you're OK. It's OK. And just love on them and bring it back a little bit and then take it away. And after, you know, a few times and they're like, oh, this isn't so bad. You know, it's not, right. I'm not going to die. It's not going to kill me, but it's not like, no, you have to deal with this. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing for kittens, for cats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can start when they start getting past that four months of age, you can definitely yep. start. And, and um, one of the, the four stages that we're supposed to talk about tonight, puppy, adolescent, uh, right. adult and senior, you know, so different, different things that apply. But I first, before we go on to that, I want to ask you, Melissa, since you breed Shih Tzus, um, with these brachycephalic breeds in this area that needs to be trimmed usually, unless they're a show dog, then you're growing that all out. Right. I mean, I, how do you start acclimatizing them to being trimmed in there and at what age and how do you do it? Because well, that's, that's the part that you get all of that. Oh, you know, I no, know. No, you know. I use a uh, wall has a little tiny mini bravura. Like it's mm -hmm. a little tiny one. And that's what I use on for my puppies. And mm -hmm. at first, before I ever start to cut, cause we call that a chrysanthemum when all that fuzziness mm -hmm. grows up like that. Yeah. So before I start to trim that chrysanthemum, I start to um, rub that little clipper around the face, over the ears, on the head, let them just get used to that just from the bathing time. You know, and Bobby, Bobby is suggesting that we use an electric toothbrush too, which is a great idea. Exactly. That would work yeah. as well. Something that has that same kind of vibrational frequency, that same kind of movement so that they get used to it and then um, do things very quickly. You know, like once they kind of get used to that feeling of that vibration on their face, then you can just, 
two little zips. It's not about precision. It's not about perfection. It's about getting them used to it. <laughs> because then once they understand that they can be still, and also I use the, um, the little tiny scissors that you use for like babies to cut their fingernails. Yeah. Yes. Ball tips on them. Yeah. So I'll use those. I may not cut anything. I just rest it there mm -hmm. and rest it there and it's okay. And talk to them and because they're like, you know, scared to death of it. Mm -hmm. If it becomes an ordinary thing, just like everything else, then they they're not afraid of it anymore and i've noticed that when you work with the seniors that start to have um issues with sight with even dementia you know they forget those things so we have to go back to those puppy training ways to work with them and 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 uh, understand that their sight isn't what it used to be you know their thought processes aren't what they used to be mm -hmm. So we have to think that way that, you know, we're, we have to go backwards and not work in frustration. Like Michelle said, you have mm -hmm. to check your emotions yes. at the door and yes. you have to be in control and in balance of yourself because they're looking to us for, um, mm -hmm. you know, what, how to respond. And since we have that science, and I love, by the way, what Gina said about using a small thinning shear. I, I do yeah. that around the corners of the eyes. Uh, but, but we have really good science, and people have seen my programs. They know that we've got uh, actual multiple uh, very famous laboratory studies that have been done about the way that dogs' eyes track the face muscles that we have in our T-zone. So it's really, really important that we smile at them and say their names and make eye contact because dogs are the only one of the canine species that makes eye contact. And we actually have um, science that says that the, one of the reasons why humans and dogs co-evolved with each other is because dogs read um, our eyes, you know, like we have white around our eyes, it's called the sclera, but all the other primates, you know, we're a primate, um, which is a family of the ma mammal family, chimpanzees, gorillas, you know, or other primates. Um, but they all have a full black or full colored eye. There's no white around the edges. This, there is only chimpanzees that have this mutation that occasionally you'll see a little bit of white around their eyes. But the fact that we humans all were a mutated primate that got that mutation is universal to us, that we all have white in our eyes, which allows us to go, you know, or surprise or sad or you know we can express emotion we can communicate our eyes like you know we can communicate with them and so and that's but when you're using that communication like you're saying you're also moving your brow muscles yes. in this t-zone T -zone muscles right yeah. right so mm -hmm. smiling you know opening right. your eyes saying their name and of course and we also have studies that they can hear emotion in our voices and that they can, they can smell it yeah yeah so your same. emotions are, yeah. are actual hormonal pheromones that exude from your skin that they smell uh they know exactly when you're afraid and exactly when you're not that's why you cannot fake being a leader you can't say well yeah i think i'm the leader if you're saying you think you're the leader you're really not you're not the leader <laughs> <laughs> you know? you're either the leader or you're not. And into, and there is a sweet spot when you cross that line and you're like, oh yeah, I get it now. Leaders are not mean. Leaders are calm. They're assertive. They know the answers, whether they know the answers or not. Uh, for someone who leads a pack who is looking to them uh, for uh, whatever, what's going to happen? Where Are we fighting? Are we resting? Are we eating? What's going on? That leader communicates all those things pheromonally, through body language, through facial expression, uh -huh. because even dogs will look to other dogs for facial expression Absolutely. or they wouldn't have developed a whale eye. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? Uh, yes. They do look at this area very much, but again, in varying degrees, some dogs don't like eye contact. Right. Some love it. So even when, if we know that scientifically, we still have to take consideration of this entire spectrum of dogs who yes. may be, you know, they might have Earth. had a bad bad experience given them Correct. instead of a good early training yeah. like what we're talking about doing. If they yeah. had a bad, if they had, because that can be like domination too. Correct. So you have well, to be you really always careful. Have to look at them as an individual. I, I, yep. Again, you know, you can have a litter of six puppies 
and each puppy is completely different than the next. They may yep. look physically the same, you know, or, or, you know, what we like to say is, you know, they're typey or, you know, the, the, they meet the standard, but emotionally they are, are very different on how they deal with uh, new situations, new experiences. And so if you do one doodle and it acts crazy on the table, it does not necessarily mean, and this is something that kind of kind of sticks in my crawl a lot when you hear groomers say, all doodles are crazy or all, I know. all pit bulls mm. are bad or all, you know, all mm. Aussies yeah. are, you know, hyper or, you know, and, and when we- It's never we, true. Right. Mm -hmm. well, Always is never true. Yeah. Generalization, generalizations are never to be used except when you're handing out cookies. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> exactly. Well, because then we already approach with a preconceived notion and you have shut right. down that energy exchange. Yeah. You've already, you've already put a block in that, um, for whoever took my class, you've already put a boulder in that chi, that flow in those meridians, because you're, you're mm -hmm. meeting them. Like I already know what you're going to act like. So you've got mm -hmm. expectations on the table. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to really, really understand, especially with puppies, because these are their formative years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so the minute you become frustrated, yes, mm -hmm. you probably won't notice it. You'll just notice your dog's acting up a little bit and you won't even you think, oh, I'm not exuding frustration, yeah. but you are. Mm -hmm. You are already. If your dog is acting up, yeah. recenter yourself or walk away for a minute put the dog up first, walk away for a minute, take a deep breath, put some cold water on your face, recenter, and then get the dog out and, and start working again. That I, I have a perfect so example. Important. When I was working at Dara's school, one of the students um, was having a, a trouble with a young, I think it was a Samoyed, and she was working with it. And she was, I could just see the frustration building, you know, as she's trying to brush this dog and work with this dog. And he's just everywhere on the table and just not allowing her to do anything. And I just stood back and I'm, I'm watching this scenario unfold mm -hmm. until finally in frustration, I could see her whole body language change, how she was approaching the dog change. Everything was in frustration and you could see it on her face. You could see it. She just tensed up. She was, instead of being more gentle, she was being a little bit rougher because she felt like she had to get control of the animal. And so I stepped over there and I said, hey, do me a favor. Take five minutes, go sit in the break room and just try and get yourself together. You're frustrated. The dog's frustrated. Do this and then come back. And I put the dog away. It wasn't like I worked on the dog while she went away. She went away. I put the dog away. She came back and I said to her, now take the dog out and put it back up on your table and start to work with it. And she was able to finish that dog mm -hmm. because she didn't understand until somebody else said to her, hey, you know, you've, you've got to get yourself rebalanced. Once she was rebalanced, the dog was rebalanced. Mm -hmm. so sometimes you have to understand it. And it was a young dog. So sometimes you have to understand that you have a small window of opportunity until they have had its sensory overload for them. Right. It is it never it is always the case whenever we're having the most busy or the most stressful day, and it doesn't matter the age of the dog, invariably, when uh, you know, if if the, the shop is noisy, stressful, busy, people are running late, the owners are calling, where's my dog, whatever, you know, might be setting your day off in a bad way. The more people hurry and need the dog to behave, the worse the dog behaves. And I tell my staff this, they are reading you and they, mm -hmm. if you are stressed and you're worried and you're upset while, while you're grooming them, they're going to start misbehaving on the table because they sense danger. They sense, right. uh, you know, it, it's, well, it's absolutely guaranteed if you don't stay calm and if you don't stay centered and, and, and Michelle, you are absolutely hundred percent right. If you feel yourself, you know, your temperature rising, put the dog away, go outside, take some deep, slow yeah. breaths, 
do deep cleansing breaths, recenter yourself. Absolutely, absolutely essential when working with live animals. Absolutely. One, of the, one of the groomers in, uh, I took one of Jonathan David's classes while I was at Amer All American and, and they were talking about um, something called the panic groom. <laughs> They're there. The groomer is in a panic state because the owner's calling or the owner standing in the lobby mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever it is that gets them panicked. That produces, like Michelle said, that produces a pheromone scent that we release that they pick up on on top of the energy that we're putting out mm -hmm. that we're trying to, you know, hurry up. And they don't understand that. They just, yeah. And there has to become a, there has to come a time. Happening. There has to come a time when the three hour or four hour or whatever hour turnaround that you think you're supposed to do is out the window. Right. Do what is best for the animal in front of you. And any mama, any client who is mad that you gave your 110% to their animal and slowed things down so your animal could get a better groom and a better time, mm -hmm. that's probably not somebody I want as a client. Right. If you don't, if you, if I love your dog more than you do, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a problem because I yeah. can do the very best I can for your dog's health and for his state of mind. Uh, and I tell people, I'm like, well, it's usually around such and such hours for this type of dog. But if we run into something or somebody ahead of him yeah. uh, has a breakdown or needs extra love or has an mm -hmm. extra mat, then that's going to lengthen your dog's grooming time. And I'm upfront with them ahead yep. of time. Yep. We, we, you can weed out those clients that need that dog back in a hurry so that you can plan your day around them. I usually have my turnaround times that need really quick directly in the morning. The first one's always fresh. First one, right. You can get that first dog out. After that, it's a free for all. And I'm telling you, I will give each dog as much time as that dog needs, even if it takes all day or if I have mm -hmm. to send it home in the middle and they have to come back right. on another day. Yeah. Uh, because it's not worth it's it to me. Way. I'm not going to rush through some beautiful dog's groom because mom is like, well, I have nine holes to do in 10 minutes. Well, do your nine holes and come back. I don't yeah. I don't know what to tell you. You know, maybe you yeah. shouldn't have planned nine holes on the, on the grooming day. I don't know. I don't know your yeah. life, That's but right. I know that my job is to do the very best I can. Uh, yeah. I don't, give, I don't promise. Day. I don't promise people times. We just give them ballparks and then we get their phone numbers. Where can I reach you today? Right. So, so what would you all say now um, to the other stages of development, adolescents, adults, um, and seniors? I, you know, I think seniors of course need as much specialized uh, and unique approaches in care and handling as do Absolutely. puppies. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. That goes without saying is, puppies and old people are, are basically the same. They get yeah. pampered and loved yeah. and don't get past their limits. Nothing uh, forced. Nothing right. forced. Comfort and, is more important. And be very than careful looks. of how you bend their joints. Some joints oh, bend, yeah. some don't anymore. They have calcification, arthritis, uh, and they don't yeah. bend like they used to. So lifting them what, what would a, a healthy younger dog be able to be bent in some con contortion? An old person cannot, uh, yeah. simply cannot. Yeah. Uh, and so you can't, and you can't expect them to be as flexible as they used to be. Exactly. And that means that you may have to have a, you know, the owner help you if you groom by yourself, right. or maybe you've got staff members that can help you. I will never groom alone. I will never, ever groom alone. Um, I've, I've done that before and invariably, um, there'll be something that you really need for the comfort and the safety of the animal. You need to have another person holding them or turning them in a way. Otherwise you just, there's certain things sometimes you can't get. Well, I'll group so, one, but know your client. Uh, yeah. If it's a brand new client and it's a, if it's a special needs, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Have somebody there with you. But I mean, if it's yeah. sometimes I groom on a Monday, some dogs that can't get in for whatever I mean, reason, or I'm going to be gone. Yeah. I'll groom a whole day of my clients that I know, but uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I do the same thing. I do groom alone actually, but I will only, you know, only when I handpick who it is. That's right. Mm -hmm. I have so, my favorite, de uh, my favorite developmental part is actually the adolescent. Adolescent. Yeah, yeah. They're, say, they are idiots. That. And they'll test you and they're silly and they yeah. play and they're, are, they're just dumb and fun and wonderful. And, and they go from so zero to 60. Back yes. And forth. Yes. They're so <laughs> weird. And sometimes yeah. they're a puppy and they forget that you can touch their mm -hmm. feet. 
but sometimes they remember and it's okay, but not that ear. So yeah. it's like some, you just have to work through it. Some days, some days you feel mm. like a nut. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that happens with humans too. Sometimes you feel like a star you're on your game, you know, you're flowing and the grooms are coming out nice and you, your scissor hits right every single time. And it's great. But sometimes you're like, uh Oh man, that's going to take another 15 minutes. Uh Oh my gosh. What have I done here? And sometimes you're like, just get the dog off my table and fix it. I don't want to look at it anymore. It happens to us too. It happens to us. True. Dogs are no different. Some days they don't want their feet touched. Right. And you have to know when to honor that and when not to, basically. Yeah, it, it is true that adolescent dogs like adolescent people test limits. I used to teach adolescent psychology. I used to teach psychology. Um, and th there, there is limit testing that is going on there. And they are finding their own adulthood, their own ability mm -hmm. to decide for themselves who they are and what they're doing with still all of that, you know, that puppy energy. And of course, the most important thing is that we are talking to our clients during each of these stages, educating them about how the grooming and what the grooming needs are of each of these ages and stages of development, communication with the family, giving them homework. I use the word homework. Maybe it's because yeah. I'm a retired teacher. I will say, here's your homework. Um, maybe the toenails were difficult. So you're going to be practicing touching and handling or maybe oh, the sound of homework something. homework pamphlets yeah. coming into my teacher. <laughs> yeah. oh, just do this. Yeah. Follow this yeah. method. What's wrong with you guys? <laughs> I just, yeah, that would be so helpful. What a great idea. And I do give homework, but you know what? It just popped into my head. We could have a handout for that. I have a yes. handout for hematoma. I have a handout for yeah. everything else. Why wouldn't you have handout for your Here's homework? Here's your homework. Yes. Your recovery homework, puppy homework, old dog homework, all that other stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, brushing, brushing. The more you educate your customer, the better your grooms will be with that animal because mm -hmm. then they can't say they didn't know that they were uninformed about, you know, how a dog might yep. react to this or that. Or, you know, so the more you do that and your people will find you that want to ha have that kind of bond with their pet. The people that don't want to be informed, that just want to shave down once a year or twice a year, and they don't want to know about good nutrition or good skin and coat health or, you know, about good training methods or any of those kind of things, you know, then those aren't the customers that you're looking for because you're looking, if you're watching this show, then you're obviously wanting a, a much broader scope of practice for, you know, what you do within your grooming practice. So yeah. you'll find your people, but you have to yeah. educate them because most people yeah. don't know. They mm -hmm. really, I think it's, really don't. It truly frustrates me when I hear groomers saying, I don't have time to educate my clients. Right. Doesn't wow. do any good anyway. You, you know, I believe that part of it, and you have to build this into your timing and into your schedule. Mm -hmm. You need to have time to talk to your clients because it, it, you have to teach them if you've got a dog coming in once a month that's a haircut type dog, remember fur type dogs and hair type dogs and my 15 coat types, I talk a lot about that. If they're a shedder versus a matter, you have to teach them what to do. You have to warn them about the seasonality of shedding. You have mm -hmm. to warn them about the, the, the medical information. I, would, I, I actually had one of the most uh, uh, aggressive uh, uh, messaging that came from a veterinary speaker, um, I don't know, some 10 years ago, a veterinarian was speaking at the All-American way back in the day. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember who it was. It wasn't Dr. Cliff because he was, you know, he's doing the skin and coat stuff. This guy was talking about a research that the American Veterinary Medical Association was tracking longitudinally. And they found that the number one thing that we need to be doing more than anything else for the long-term health of these dogs is toenails. Because toenails, if they're walking on this instead of on that, instead of right. if they got the nail bending the bones back, then it, it's like a woman well, wearing- Well, it's more like this. Yes, exactly. Their nails are so it, long that their toes can't touch. the toes rock back. Then they'll yeah. break the whole foot. The entire yeah. foot structure will be broken and, and that works its way on their pasterns. Yeah. And then it works its way up yeah. into the body because they're walking on that. And, and actually that can, it's just like a woman wearing four inch high heels, eight hours a day, seven days a week, she's mm -hmm. going to have back problems. There mm -hmm. is no way that people, 
you know, all, they just don't know this. I have had so many people tell me, oh, what do you mean I am the national veterinary medical recommendation for toenails is every two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. Are you serious? You know, I thought I was only going to come to a groomer, you know, a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. You have to, I, I make people that are, I, I require all my haircut dogs four or five or six week schedules. If they're on a six week schedule, they're coming in halfway for nails because mm -hmm. you don't want to let the quick grow out. You can't, you know, you have to stay and up on that. how important point. is that for puppies? How so important. important. How important is that? Start that is young. a foundational thing for, mm -hmm. for working with dogs. Is how but, they, but also in speaking to the, um, the education of your clientele, the number one, and we have all discussed this in so many groups, I can't even my head. The reason that we have a lot of the problems that we have is because of clients not knowing information. The biggest yep. chasm between us and veterinarians and clients is their knowledge. Right. If they don't know, if they're not at a level where they can speak to us about basic skincare, then they don't even know enough to talk to us about skincare or right. nail yep. or ear care or anything else. It is your job to bring them up to speed so that you're on a level where you can actually talk with one talk another. Yeah, veterinarians do it all point. the time. Yeah, yep. when, the, when the pet comes out of surgery, so this is what we did, this is what it looks like. They're yep. trying to educate their clients so that they're comfortable, number one, spending the money, caring for their dog, and knowing that they made a really good choice. So that is that is part and parcel of being a groomer. All the groomers Absolutely. out there who don't think that they need to educate, well, I'm not here to teach. Yeah, you are. You're here to teach yep. dogs. You're here to teach other human beings and you're here to teach other groomers as well. Just like Absolutely. any professional, you're a professional yeah. doing a service. If I go to a beautician and ask her some question about my hair, I'm going to expect, you know, or if I'm trying to deal with some problem or if I go to my doctor, I expect them to give me information that's going to help me learn. And I love what Kim said. Yeah. Kim, Kim you've got our number. We are groomers that love learning. Um, yeah. I love groomers who love learning themselves also want the clients to learn. That's yeah. right. Well, think about it this way. If you went to your hairdresser and you said, hey, you know, I'm I'm thinning on top or, you know, my hair is breaking off and I'm not understanding what's going on. Can you go to your doctor? I'd be like, mm. well, aren't you the hair person? My doctor's <laughs> not really the hair person, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you know one of the things about puppies and adolescents that my clients are the most grateful for this information is about puberty and coat change yes, and how yes. the matting and tangling, the intense matting and, and tangling. that's huge when they understand huge. that there is the actual hormonal change and physical mm -hmm. changes going on. And, and, and I actually to tell them. Yes. And it actually matters, you know, your knowledge of that individual dog's coat and whether or not it's fur or hair and whether or not it's going to be, you know, really thick and heavy or if it's going to be thinner and silkier. You're going to tell them all of these things and you're going to give, you're maybe even offering for sale the kind of right grooming tools that they're going to need for this homework that they've got to do. I, I actually created, and I'm going to give this as a gift all of you have permission to use this. It is carte blanche. I, I thought of it during the Atlanta Pet Fair, but I created a triangle diagram. And I wish I had it with me here, but I don't. It's at my shop. It's a triangle diagram, okay? And at the three points of the triangle, and I put this laminated, put it in my front office so that I could use it to show people, because people are visual learners, mm -hmm. that there is a connection between the price of the groom, right? the length between visits, how often they have to come, that's point one and point two, and point three, the length and texture of the hair, the thickness of the texture and then what length they want it. So if they want it longer and they've got thick hair, then their hair every week or every two weeks and it's gonna cost more or whatever. So you show the relationship between price, frequency of visit and the length and texture of the hair. And once you explain to them the connection between those things and explain also not just about puberty, but about the fact that they are uh, they have friction areas, I call them, mm -hmm. places right. where they rub more, like behind the elbows or between the toes or behind the ears or around the collar or you know, between the front legs where the legs are going all the time. Mm -hmm. I explain friction areas. I explain the impact that water has if they get wet and then they just let it dry and they don't. I actually have a pamphlet that says, congratulations, you own a mogwai. 
So yeah. if, you get, if you get them wet, you get wet it turns yeah. into a gremlin. Yeah. If you get them wet, and, and then I go through all the scenarios of how they get wet, sprinklers, bathing, uh, playing at the lake, playing at the pool. Yep. Walking in the grass. Splashes them. Yeah. yeah. It's the dew in the morning on the grass. Yeah. All of those things. And it, they have to get it combed out before it dries. So, yeah, I, I do have a little pamphlet. It, it gives that same thing. And technically, I guess we could make one for all the basic types because yeah. they have mm. a different treatment, um, which yep. is something that we're going to get into when we do the overlay of the 15 cotites. Which is going to be so exciting. <laughs> it's going to be great. So, yeah, well, but that has a lot to do with it. And I think that a lot of people are just stymied because they don't understand the needs of their particular dog. They got their dog for every other reason except for what that dog was bred for uh because it was cute because i liked that color because i wanted that size because he had one because whatever it's never because you know what i did my research and i think you know a springer would be the perfect for my family because we we do go fishing we do outdoors activities blah blah, blah. that's how you should buy it. that's how you should get a, a companion right you pick yeah. the companion that is fit to your lifestyle you know yes. if you're this hunter outdoorsman whatever what are you doing with a bichon what are you doing? Well, right. It's going to be shaved down with one or whatever, or nose yeah. to tail all the time. So it can live yep. its life with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. You, congratulations you and Amagwa. I'm think, so, I'm so glad Jessica, Kim, everybody that's saying that this is helpful information. Thank you for saying that. That's really good to know. And I agree with you, Tanya, uh, Tanya Sue, mm -hmm. <laughs> Tomats from from oh hell. yeah yes. absolutely yeah. from dewy mm -hmm. walks mm -hmm. in the morning before yeah. they mm -hmm. go in the house i, I had a dog come in the other day owned by an elderly woman it was a shih tzu matted had grown out with mats and just continued to be matted dog was miserable uh and the woman didn't know it was matted. It's an older lady she thought the dog was fluffy yeah <laughs> and if you i mean I know different, but, but I've had 35 years worth of training and mentorship and people telling me and showing me an experiment experimentation. She's this old lady that loved a dog right. and she didn't know. And I took the time, even though I didn't have the time, I made the time. We have a table out in our front lobby. I plopped the dog up on there and I'm like, look, and I took a comb and I lovingly split this hair. And I said, he's going to look totally different. He's going to be naked. But in the next two grooms, we're going to decide on how long you want that baby. And then we're going to tell you how often you need to come. So that baby stays the way you like it. Yes. And that really is that triangle. That, yes. that yes. really is what it is. Uh, but unless you, unless I took the time to educate this woman, she would just be upset that every time she brings her beautiful dog in that she loves fluffy, that it just gets naked all the time. And no one's ever explaining to her why. Why? Uh -huh. it's, it's your, it's our responsibility to make sure they do know why and if they want something different how to get there from here well i think that that's yep. the fundamental thing is that especially with customers that are starting with you as a puppy you know they bring that puppy to you i think there's it's a twofold thing i think that number one um that you have to have a spirit of compassion that you are able to be compassionate towards that animal as it goes through those um those milestones of aging into, you know, from puppyhood to adolescence to, you know, adulthood to senior. A right. lot of us start out with puppies and we groom them throughout their lives. Yeah. And so number one, I think that there should be, um, that you should be in that spirit of adolescence. I mean, in that, uh -huh. in that spirit of compassion, whether you're dealing with them as a young puppy or you're getting them as a young adolescent, I think mm -hmm. that that's a huge thing and just small sidebar. I'm, I'm actually going to be upload tomorrow, putting on my website so that they'll be able to download it for free. The, the principles that I wrote of principles of compassion. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. So mm -hmm. those will be at on the oil and Those will be on my website read. for free as of tomorrow. I put them in my class, but you Yay. guys have them and download them. And then, I think the second portion of that is that we have to make a strike a bargain with ourselves as groomers that we need to be that bridge between that pet owner and that pet so that we can help them That's be right. the best pet owner that they can be. Mm -hmm. So and so they bought a dog that's not really what they thought about or they right. didn't put any thought into it. But you know what? That's already done. 
So let's not stay in that vein. Let's take this puppy or this adolescent dog um, and meet them where they are without judgment. Right. Without judgment. And they're right, doing their best. Right. Yep. They're doing mm -hmm. their best. So let's just step out of that judgment and let's just step into the role that we are. We're the expert. Right. We are the one that they're saying, here, help. I want my dog shorter or I want my dog to look like. Yeah, this. you should never yell at people for coming to you for help. Or, Absolutely treat, or not. treat them, yeah. you know, treat them like they're idiots or because yeah. some things are, are second nature to us as groomers. Mm -hmm. And some of us are generational. I mean, like I grew up with a brush in my hand. Mm -hmm. So um, that doesn't mean that and my, you know, my kids aren't groomers, but they know way more than somebody else would know because they were yeah. exposed to this. So we have to really step out of that judgment. I see that a lot where, you know, they're like, oh, they got this puppy and they don't know what the heck they're doing. And you know what? That transfers to your work and how you mm -hmm. deal with that animal. The animal mm -hmm. feels that, you know, mm -hmm. so we need to step out of that and, and understand that that's part of my job. Now, if the human being doesn't want to take your advice, doesn't want to listen to what you have to say, then you have the right to say, I'm not the groomer for you. Yes. Yeah. But we have to at least put that out there and have to act in compassion. It literally means to end suffering. So yes. we want to end the suffering. We don't want that animal to suffer and we don't want that owner to be suffering. Right. And, and I a love lot of times they leave because they feel like, oh, the, no. oh you they know, don't the like me. Yes, yeah, right. they don't like me or they don't like my dog or, yep. you know, they yep. make me feel weird. I don't weird. feel comfortable there. You invite yeah. them into your front room. Absolutely. Yep. That is your home. That is your yeah. safe place for them to bring their questions and their pet. And you have to create that. And, and because they are coming to you, most of them within that, within that realm of that kind of spirit. Now, if, you know, uh -huh. if they're not, and they're just being like, uh, I only want to pay this much money and I only want you to do this and blah, blah, blah. That you don't have to de deal with that. That's not right. what you do. So, uh -huh. and you can easily explain that in a, in a nice gentle tone and say, you know, Oh, I'm sorry. I completely understand your budgetary restrictions and you know, whatever. And I'm sure that there's a groomer out there that'll fit all check all those boxes for you, but that's not me. You know, right. and and walk away knowing. Don't judge them. It's there's there's no need for that. And I love what Kim said that 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 if you take this time and, and to you know build that into your into your thoughts about the day's schedule is that you are going to be talking to your clients, especially right. early on in the in that relationship. That does lead. That does increase their loyalty, and it absolutely makes a difference in the online reviews. Kim, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I would say probably fully a third to maybe even almost a half of my online reviews talk about the fact that they, you know, got such great helpful information from when I talked to them in the lobby about, you know, things that they can do to better their relationship with their dogs, especially after the pandemic, when we've had so many people get new dogs for the first time in many cases, they don't know anything about it. It's really, oh, look at that little face, Michelle. I know. Aww. Oh, She's got some cutie patooties. I know, there. absolutely. So um, we are about we're about out of, of time for our hour. Yeah, um, uh, can you guys? Uh, do you guys want to just plug what you're doing? I'm, I'm Melissa and I were just together at the All American. It was wonderful. Um, both of us had great classes with great turnout. Um, yeah. I did my 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 15 code types. You did your massage class, which was amazing. It was standing room only. It was awesome. Um, and then the three of us are going to be together. Michelle, you want to talk about the uh, October? At the, at the Dallas Classic in October. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we are going to, that show's just going to be amazing. All of you are there at the same time. We're going to have a booth for the school and for the uh, Master Groomer Council of Best Practices, which I'm still working on the PDF. I want it to be perfect. I'm a perfectionist. Yes. It's killing me. Uh, so, hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Uh, but, Hi, yeah, so we are going forward with that. It's going to be amazing. Melissa is actually working on our website. 
uh, for that. And as soon as we get the PDF together, it mm -hmm. will be downloadable from the actual website. Yeah, from well, the website. I'll be in and, the and each of us is going to be teaching our sort of signature full. One of the things I love about Pam's uh, Pet Pro Classic in Dallas, which is October 21 to 24, the website is petstylist.com. Yes com yes. petstylist.com you can learn about the class the pet pro classic in dallas texas october 21 to 24. oh yeah that's right we're all doing certificate classes yes, yes all so of us there's are doing... actually a, an all-day seminar on skin and coat from myself and therapeutics there's and the 15, 15 and, and types, 15 from... types and in-depth a uh, human dog yes. science stuff and from this is, these are certificate courses so yep. you will be getting a certificate when you obtain all of those classes i'm uh, doing melissa, and melissa, actually, you're are gonna you doing do feline? I'm doing the quintessential feline. So, mm -hmm. yep, we're going to talk uh, feline skin yeah. and coat, handling, temperaments, all that good, everything. All of the stuff. And she's so. letting, and that's the thing I love about Pam is that she's she's giving us the time we need to really go in depth. These classes are going to be very in depth. It's going to yep. be wonderful. And not only um, that, on Sunday, Gina, on I the am very coming last day, to England. Gina, uh, at the very last day, we are actually going to be doing uh, a panel. Yes. About yeah. the future of grooming, uh, where yes. we take questions, talk about where we're at, uh, what the future holds, um, the, what the new modern groomer is going to maybe look like, uh, and what we'll be learning in the future. So When I mean, we first formed our little group with Dara, the four of us, um, we call the Pet Pro Educators, we uh, created as our tagline, the future of an evolved grooming profession. And that is definitely us. Oh, good. Dara put it on there as the link oh, good. Yeah. The for that. Um, and yes, Gina was asking about some of us going to New England show. I will be there. I will be oh. there also. Yay! I will also be at Hershey teaching. So will I. Yes, I'll be at Hershey. I'm yeah. also, I also have an online seminar coming up on uh, the 5th and 6th of September. It's the groomers DIY. So I'm going to be doing feline spa so treats and I'm going to do a bathtub mixologist for canines. So how to make up all your, um, your spa treatments and that kind of stuff that's coming up. Look, just yeah. go to my website. And for that, I also have my book. It's probably hard to see cause it's green. You can't see it. <laughs> my green yeah. screen. It's but, a ghost book. It's a ghost book, but I do have a book and it's called The 28 Day Journey. It's a meditation journal for metaphysical animal lovers. If you Google my name, Melissa Conti Diener on Amazon, you can buy it. And it is a nominal fee. It's just to help you help yourself get centered, stay centered and create a healthy practice for your life. And, and Kim, if your daughter wants to take classes uh, with me and she has dyslexia, have her get a hold of Dara and myself, and we will absolutely tailor the program for her needs. We are uh, ADA compatible. Uh, so I and I also have a shadow master's degree now in helping people with disabilities as well, especially yeah. with their sight. Oh, yeah. Oh, and so, I forgot absolutely. to mention. I forgot we will to have some that. solutions for people who are low vision or dyslexic uh, or have issues, but still are groomers and want to know that information. So you get a hold of the school and myself. Uh, you can email me directly or through my Facebook page, and uh, we will absolutely make that happen for you. And I forgot to mention that uh, I partnered up with the whole Pet Grooming Academy, like um, Michelle hey. as well. And I have three uh, full master courses. One is pet massage, which is encompasses both cats and dogs. And then I have pet aromatherapy, which again, feline and canine. And then I have the, uh, the uh, holistic feline groomer course as well. So um, all three of those are levels one through 400. And so you start out at the basics and can go all the way up to the masters and mm -hmm. everything, uh, through the the whole pet grooming academy is a uh, that's great Washington state school. yeah it's a diploma course it's all of those are diploma, diploma course, courses right. as well it's not certificate yeah. right. right not just the certificate yeah these are like yeah you're going to an actual it's real school, school. you're getting a, a real <laughs> degree all right well thanks you guys this was a great show and thank you dara we love you we miss you we, we know yes, your dara, we, we you. know your internet is a frustration for you um but anyway you, you still made the show happen so thank you for that so we'll see everybody next monday night for the groomers cut and um we hope to see everybody 
Uh, uh, Melissa and I hope to see everybody in Hershey. And yeah, I believe the 22nd of this month is the next um Yes, Master it is. Groomer Master Council. Groomer Council. If you awesome. are not a member yet and mm -hmm. you want to start talking about what the standards are in the industry and, and getting your name in the book, uh, please uh, mm -hmm. go through the Pet Pro Educator Facebook page and get an application. It's in files. Uh, submit that and we will get you entered into the group. Great. All right. All right, everybody. Have a great week. I don't know how we do. Can we do the closing credits? Do we? I don't know if they, we're just going to even do it. <laughs> we'll just sign off, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Bye. You guys have a great week. Thank you.